I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and welcome to Scripture and Tradition, where we take a look at the sacred Word of God, and we are especially taking a look at it in order to help us enter into the Word of God prayerfully and find our own relationship with Christ in those sacred words of Scripture. Now today we will look at our Lord's trial in the court of Annas the high priest. We'll take a look also to see how St. Peter responds when pressure is put on him. Now we are continuing on in a study of my book, Wheat and Tares. If you have any questions or comments related, especially to today's topic, we invite you to be part of the show by calling us during the live broadcast, which is at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And the number you can call if you are in North America is 1-800-221-9460. 1-800-221-9460. If you are outside North America, you can still call, but the number is... Country code 1, area code 205-271-2980. That's 1-205-271-2980. You can also send an email by writing to scriptureandtradition at ewtn.com. And you can also follow us and participate with the show on YouTube. So that's what we're doing. So as we continue on in Wheaton Tears, uh, uh, book subtitled Restoring the Moral Vision of a Scandalized Church, uh, you can follow along with us. Uh, you can get a copy of the book at EWTN's Religious Catalog. Just go to EWTNRC.com. It is item 81098. 81098. Today we're starting our discussion on page 99 in that book. So today we are considering, uh, as I mentioned at the outset, Jesus' trial in the court of Annas, the high priest. He was retired at this point. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas. We talked about that last time. Uh, he had been high priest until... Uh, the year 16 A.D., and then his son took over, and then Caiaphas took over in 26 uh, A.D. under Pontius Pilate. When Pontius Pilate became procurator in 26 A.D. And we see um, that uh, the, the New Testament mentions in John 18, verse 13, that they first led Jesus to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, uh, and had would stay high priest from 26 until 36. Uh, we know that not just from this mention here in the uh, New Testament, but also we know that from the history of the Jews and uh, the, the Jewish antiquities and the Jewish wars by the Jewish historian uh, Josephus. So we, we have evidence outside as well. Now, we also see that St. John mentions in chapter 18, verse 14, that it was Caiaphas who had given counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. That was considered a prophecy that he had given a little bit earlier. Um, and this was something he had said back in John chapter 11, beginning with verse 49, where it says, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. You do not understand that it is expedient for you that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation should not perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation and not for the nation only, but to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So this is uh, beginning this realization, this growing realization 
that our Lord uh, died not in futility, not by an accident, as I've heard one cult leader had written. I read it, actually. But rather, this was to save the whole world. Now, when we take a look uh, at this uh, passage, we see that it's in the house of Caiaphas that St. Peter begins his denials. Um, and, you know, it, it's something important to note that before the trials actually began, each of the evangelists introduces the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy of Peter's denial. We, we see this in a number of places. Matthew 26, verses 33 to 35, Jesus said that Peter would pre deny him three times. Mark 14, 29 to 31. Luke 22, 33 to 34. John 13, 37 to 38. All these places predicted that Peter would deny Jesus. It's something that our Lord is well aware of. And he had said so ahead of time. And it, it's worth mentioning that in St. Mark, chapter 14, verses 53 to 54, and in Luke 22, verse 54, all, by the way, all these verses are in the book, if you want to get hold of them. Uh, we see that St. Mark and St. Luke simply mention the house of the high priest, but they don't name him. They don't mention his name the way John did. And St. Matthew said that those who had, this is in 20, Matthew 26, verse 57, those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and elders had gathered. But Peter followed him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest, and going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. It is only St. John who offers more details and this is something he does on a number of other occasions. There are a number of times that St. John gives us more details than the other Gospels did. And one of the suggestions I've heard, and I think there's something to this, is that by the time St. John was writing his Gospel in the 90s, a lot of the details could be told because by that point, everybody involved was already dead. Caiaphas had already died. Uh, Simon Peter had died. The other apostles had died. So it was easier to talk about what had happened without any concern of revealing information to the Romans, or to the Jewish uh, police. But it would be much more that they'd be concerned about the Romans than they would about anybody else. So that's one of the reasons I think we see that. And the, one of the details that we get <coughs> here is that in John 18, beginning with verse 15, St. John wrote, Simon Peter followed Jesus, just like the others had said. And so did another disciple, as this disciple was known to the high priest. He entered the court of the high priest along with Jesus, while Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the maid who kept the door and brought Peter in. So this, again, is another kind of detail of this disciple. We believe it's St. John himself. And that also helps to explain why he would give us this detail, remembering even that it was a maid at the door that he spoke to. Now, this does not... Um, you know, mean that everything is going to go real smoothly. Um, and we see that 
in all four Gospels, this maid is the first one to question Peter and evoke his first denial. So in John 18, verse 17, the maid who kept the door said to Peter, Are not you also one of this man's disciples? He said, I am not. And again, you can see that the rest in uh, the parallels. Matthew 26, 69, Mark 14, 66, Luke 22, 56, 57. They all had that same kind of dialogue with the maid. That's an interesting detail that they all remember this woman. And I don't know. I, you know again, we, we have to be careful, but... Uh, you know, about too much speculation. But when a person is remembered that well and that uniformly, it was obviously an important detail. And it may be that that maid is someone who became a Christian herself later on. She may well have been part of, of the Christian community. And her question is remembered. And and the reason I say that is it would be easy to say, well, someone asked Peter. They could just put someone, T. You know, very easy. But all four Gospels remember this lady. And I just have a suspicion she may eventually have ended up as part of the Christian community. I guess but uh, I guess based on this kind of detail. Now, as far as Peter goes, though, notice that in spite of the way that he had protested during the Last Supper, I would never deny you. First time a woman asks him, you were one of the disciples. Oh, don't know the guy. Don't, Don't know what you're talking about. And this is his first denial. Then we see, again, in uh, all four Gospels, this next detail, Peter joined the soldiers and servants to warm himself near a fire. Um, In John 18, verse 18, the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold. And they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. Now, I want to mention at the outset, this is the first of two charcoal fires that are mentioned in the Bible. In the whole Bible, a charcoal fire is mentioned only twice. Both times in the Gospel of St. John. This time during Peter's denials and the second charcoal fire will be in John 21 when our Lord goes to Peter and says, Peter, do you love me? That's the second charcoal fire. So these charcoal fires are the places where Peter denies that he knows Jesus and then professes that he loves him. That'll be very important. We'll talk more about that when we get to John 21 in chapter 7 of my book. But I just want you to take note of that now. We'll bring it up again later. Now, while Peter is warming himself, and just so you know, um, a spring night, we think of the Holy Land as hot, and it can be very, very hot. I've been in uh, Israel and in the Palestinian territory, and it's been 125 degrees above zero Fahrenheit. That's hot, I assure you. And Uh, but not always. And in the springtime, especially at night, 
it can get pretty cold. And in the winter, it can be cold. Even sometimes it snows. I've been there for snow. Um, and you know, it can be a very chilly night, as we see at springtime anywhere. So he's warming himself. And at that point, St. John moves the attention away from Peter and goes to the questions of Annas the high priest. And this, uh, where we see that the high priest Annas, this is John 18, verse 19, the high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. And this is something important because the disciples could be a subversive group. There were subversive groups. Remember, we talked a long time ago about uh, the uh, apostle who was a zealot. And the zealots were people that used violence to try to overthrow the Romans. So that would be one of the issues and probably a few other questions he had. And then he also wants to know about his teaching. Our Lord answered Annas in verse 20. I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing secretly. Now, that's a very good point to make because we see that our Lord teaches a lot. Uh, for instance, in uh, Matthew uh, chapters uh uh, 21 to 23, Jesus was teaching in the temple between uh, the uh, Palm Sunday procession and Holy Thursday. Same is true in Mark 11 to 12, Luke 19, 29 to 20, 47. Our Lord was quite open in the temple. Anybody could have heard whatever he said. And it was Pharisees and Sadducees and Herodians who all tried to question Jesus and trip him up. They heard what he said. So this is something that uh, he had mentioned. Plus, uh, elsewhere, he uh, had spoken quite publicly. For instance, he is in the temple, especially in John chapter 5 to 10. Most of that teaching goes on in the temple or nearby. So it's very public in John's gospel and the other gospels as well. And yet they didn't arrest him in those times. They had nothing on him, nothing that he had done wrong. And secondly, they didn't arrest him because they were afraid of the crowds and the reactions of the crowds. The crowds loved his teaching and they listened carefully. And in fact, their own instinct of faith was stirred up within them to respond well to Jesus. Take a look at Matthew 21, verse 46, or Mark 12, 37, uh, Luke 19, 47 to 48, and other passages. The people loved what Jesus was saying. And this is uh, something that is very important to keep in mind. Um, so the question is uh, a very important one, but he's barking up the wrong tree. So he has other questions, and I think it's relevant to this whole issue that we're addressing, namely the sex abuse scandal. I'll show the relevance to that when we come back in a couple minutes after a short break. So please stay with us. Right. 
Now we continue on. We're, we're taking a look at our Lord's trial under the high priest Annas. And I'd like to try to bring this around to seeing the questions that he asks Jesus about his disciples and his teaching when our Lord had been completely open. And part of the relevance to the, the situation of our sexual scandals in the church, but also elsewhere in our society, that the teachings about human sexuality and in general intemperance and self-control, these are part of the open teaching of the church. This is not something up for grabs or something hidden. It's quite open. Part of it comes just from natural law. Part of it comes from revelation. And we need to understand that. First of all, from natural law, it's important for us to realize that everybody in the world should already have a sense of learning to control their appetites. We human beings have lots of natural appetites. And those appetites are themselves not bad. It's good to have an appetite for food, for air, for water, and for sexuality. All of those things are, are fine. But we also have to remember that there is a disorder in the way we like things in the world. We, we follow our appetites. That disorder is the result of original sin that puts those desires in disorder. So that is my summary statement on that. We desire a lot less broccoli than we desire ice cream. That's part of life. And uh, that goes for all sorts of other aspects. So people would desire more sex than they would have a desire for the responsible raising of children and responsible growing closer to a spouse. This is where, you know, part of the virtue of temperance. Temperance is what's called a cardinal virtue. It's one of the natural virtues. The pagans talk about it. Aristotle develops it very well. And that everybody has to have temperance. So you don't give in to every desire that comes along. If you do that, you'll die from indulging yourself uh, in alcohol or sometimes in too much sex and a variety of other things. So uh, you know, overeating food can kill you. Um, you know, this is true in general. So we have to have temperance. But we also, as Christians, this is where revelation comes in. As Christians, we not only seek temperance, that is self-control, and keeping the appetites in a proper balance. And what makes it a proper balance? that you orient your appetites towards a greater good so that you learn to eat a balanced diet for the greater good of maintaining good health. And you order your uh, drink desires, or alcohol, a little alcohol seems to be good for, for bodies, but drunkenness is bad. So you orient it towards that self-controlled use of alcohol. And same with sexuality. It's meant for the procreation of children and the building of a bond between a man and a woman. You orient it towards that greater good, not towards gratifying everything that comes to mind. So this is where the higher value has to come in with temperance and seeing it in a greater perspective. And for us, this especially requires us to understand our temperance, our self-control in light of the vocations that God gives us. God is the one that calls us to a whole way of life. Not only different jobs. So, Right. You can say my job is working with uh, in TV, used to be teaching high school, used to be uh, teaching at the university and so on. Those are jobs. 
and they can change. But my vocation to the priesthood and to my order, the Society of Jesus, that is a vocation from God in the jobs. Just like a man to, and a woman are called to marry each other. There may be various jobs they do within the marriage, but the vocation is to marriage. And that's why people who are called by God to holy matrimony are called to live temperately. They have a certain kind of restraint that they have to have before marriage, avoiding fornication. During marriage, avoiding any kind of adultery and also avoiding any abuse of their spouse, avoiding mental adultery, that would be by desire, through things like pornography. You know, all of that is part of the tem uh, temperance that a person has to have. For those who are called to religious life and the priesthood, we are called to give up the goods of marriage. And therefore, we have to see that our lack of sexual expression is meant to support and promote the kingdom of God. This is why in Matthew 19, verse 12, it is Jesus Christ himself who taught. For there are eunuchs who have been sold from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is to able to receive this, let him receive it. Those called to ch a, a chaste celibacy are called to do this for the sake of the kingdom of God. And we have to maintain a proper chastity. There's a chastity within marriage so that you don't be looking at other people and a proper uh, uh, chastity in religious life and in the priesthood, that we have to maintain that. Tragically, we live in a culture that rejects sexual morality as it's always been understood in the church and in society in general. The sexual revolution of the late 1960s led a lot of people to consider marriage as unnecessary. And now, in the 21st century, just 50 years or so later, we see that the majority of adults are not married. First time in our history that's the case. And that 50% of all children are born to unmarried people that they don't make that commitment. We see in our society that birth control and abortion are positive goods, uh, and marriage is being, or they're trying to redefine marriage to include people of the same gender. Gender is treated like silly putty. You can um, you know, switch genders, uh, whether by physical changes, though you can't really switch genders. And when people take the surgeries and the hormone treatments, it reduces their life expectancy by 50%. They don't want to tell you that. They want to pretend that it's all interchangeable. And all in all these ways, and we have theologians, Christian theologians, who sometimes try to adapt to this. They, uh, on one hand, they are more interested in conforming to the society than they are conforming their hearts and minds to Jesus Christ and his teachings. They become like the Sadducees. See, one of the key things about the Sadducee culture is that they try to act like the Romans. And before that, when they were founded in the second century BC, they tried to act like the Greeks and imitated the Greeks. And this is something that goes all the way back to 1 Maccabees chapter 1, uh, beginning with verse 10 and following. It says, from them, the, the Sadducees, came a sinful root. Um, and in those days, lawless men came forth from Israel and misled many, saying, let us go and make a covenant with the Gentiles round about us. 
For since we separated from them, many evils have come upon us. And it pleased the people. And they joined themselves and sold themselves to do evil. And it mentions how they built a gymnasium. The reason that was so bad is it was, you know, they, they did their sports in the nude. And then following the Gentile custom, custom, they removed the sign of circumcision with surgery. And they abandoned the Holy Covenant. They joined with the Gentiles and sold themselves to do evil. These same temptations exist among many modern Christians and theologians who try more and more to imitate all of these folks. And this is something where you see Christians who claim to be theologians or leaders in the church trying to promote these cultural values that we see around us. And they not only agree with them, they think that this is good. And they're trying to get this. And some of the speeches at the Synod seem to be in that direction. And while loving and accepting other people is key, and we accept everybody and love everyone, at the same time, the behavior cannot be condoned if it's, if it's sinful behavior. And we also see that you know, it's going on in Ohio right now. There are super wealthy people in our culture who are buying billboards all over the state in the name of a group that they invented called Catholics for Choice. And they want to promote the killing of children. In this way, they are no different than the terrorists from Hamas who killed babies in a hospital by beheading them. So also these people would chop pe babies in the womb to pieces. And rich people support that because they don't want babies. They don't want Catholic babies. And they use this deception to promote abortion and other sinful behaviors as well. And sometimes we even hear of bishops who, I don't know the reasons, but they forbid their priests to take part in pro-life activities to oppose abortion. I've heard sometimes priests are even ordered not to preach against abortion or against birth control because it makes some people uncomfortable. Well, if they are committing the sin, they should be uncomfortable. Uncomfortable to the point of going to confession and repenting of the sin. But any ecclesiastic, any priest who would promote or, or hold back from preaching against abortion and birth control and, and all the rest, these things are something that uh, we have to see are absolutely wrong. And they'll, quite, they'll answer to God for that, me, I'm nobody, but they'll answer to our Lord for this. And it is our task especially within the clergy, to make sure that we call weaker Christians who engage in illicit sexual relations, in abortion, in birth control, and other areas that have to do with not controlling the appetites, to repent of these things and come closer to Jesus Christ and ask for his grace to fight against pornography and all the other is aspects that our modern society would use to destroy us. So these are some of the things where the questions of the high priest Annas to Jesus can you know, cause us to think about our own basic attitudes to the public teaching of Christ in regard to human life and morality, marriage, children, and realize our responsibility to stand with Christ and his public teaching. Okay? All right. Let's take a, a question now. We have a question from Joan in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. 
Joan, what can we do for you? Um, hi, Father. It's always a pleasure when I get to talk to you. Well, thank um, you. I am with a Legion of Mary mm-hmm. in my parish, and nice. we do evangelization a yes, lot of you times do. It's door to door. And yeah. you know the limited time that you have, and you never know who's going to be on the other side of that door. Mm-hmm. And they could be Presbyterian, Lutheran, Muslim, a lot of Muslims now because of immigration coming sure. into the area. Sure. And I was wondering um, if this would be a good place for us to start, but then if you could flesh out ways that if I start out with something like this, that might help us to get and say within a five-minute time frame, which is extremely hard mm-hmm. to do. Um, Absolutely. But if we start it with John 11, um, that one man should die for many, and then go into the whole thing about all the nations, all the religions, just to put that in some type of an order where I might get some of that out within five minutes. Instead of going into well, the charcoal fire that was only mentioned, there's yeah, yeah. so many no, things no. that you could jump off onto. Yeah, no, no, no. You can't go into all all of those other issues um, in that five minutes. No, here's something that I would do. Um, I, I learned this from a, a priest who was older than I. Matter of fact, he was in his late seventies. And I met him back in the 1990s. I'm pretty sure he's passed away. But he was sent to a very small church of 250 Catholics. And he would go door to door in his parish every week uh, uh, on his day off, on Wednesdays. And it would take him about two years, but he would go through the whole parish and then start over again. And he had a little card with a number and said, uh, he would say it this way, you can adapt it to yourselves. Hi, I'm a Catholic priest. I'm over at this church uh, in Huntington Beach. And uh, if you have any questions about the Catholic Church, or if you have any needs from a priest, I would certainly be available, and here's a number. And then you can conclude, you know, with something, you know, we preach the the love of uh, God and you can use John 3 16 like many evangelicals that's a very powerful verse God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son to to die for us so that all who believe in him would have eternal life that you want to get across that John 3 16 was Pope St. John Paul's favorite Bible verse quoted it everywhere have something like that Put that even on the back of your card and then just smile and move on so that they don't feel like there's something they got to do right away. And if they have questions, then take them on. And if you don't know the answer to a question they ask, don't pretend. Say, you know, that's an interesting question. I don't know, but I will go and look it up and I will get back to you. Uh, but that's, that's the way I would st- start off, real simply, real basic. And, you know, uh, I would use John 3, 16 as the verse uh, I would use. It works at the football games. I'd use it uh, elsewhere, too. Okay? All right. I have to take a quick little break. We'll come back in just a couple of minutes. First of all, before we get to more phone calls and questions, I want you to join me tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time for EWTN Live. We will be speaking with author and pilgrimage leader Steve Ray about the first book in the Bible, Genesis, which means beginning. Steve will share 
that Genesis reveals so much more than origins, but also talks about our purpose, our meaning, and God's plan for humanity. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, it's a good book, and we'll uh, discuss that book with him tomorrow night. Sure, you have a lot of good questions, too. All right, let's go to another call. We have Cindy in the great state of Ohio. Hello, Cindy. Hi, hi Father Mitch. What can we do for you today? Well, um, I was telling the lady that uh, I always ask my son to go with me at Christmas Eve Mass because I sing in the choir and I just really want him to be there with me. Mm -hmm. And he does. But now he's going to a different church and he says, okay, Mom, I want you to come to my church the next few Sundays, which I could do. I could go to Saturday Mass. Mm -hmm. But his, his pastor is preaching on the Ezekiel Wars and how, how the devil hates the Holy Land because that's where Christ is going to come back and put his you know, foot on the Mount of Olives. And with all, if this war escalates, my question is, could it be the Ezekiel War? Here would be my sense, and this is something I, to which I always respond when it comes to now by Ezekiel Wars, I presume that he means the wars mentioned in Ezekiel 38 and 39, correct? Right, where all the nations come against Israel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I don't know. Uh, we have to remember this, that this is a question for management. And as I've said many times over the years, God is management. I'm in sales, and so are you, and so is that preacher. And knowing if this is a, a war that is predicted in the book of Ezekiel or not is not really the big issue. That, that's not the big concern. The big concern is whether we are ready for, to meet Jesus Christ. That's the bottom line issue. And pay attention to what he says, um, you know, and, and check on it. Uh, and what time is their church service? Do you know? Well, I think their church service is, um, I think it gets started, they do all that singing like at 930. Mm -hmm. And then I think it gets started around 10. And then my service is at 11. They don't get out to like 12. So mm -hmm. I'd probably have to go to Mass on Saturday. Well, but I do to, want him to come with me on Christmas Eve, and I don't think he will. Well, well, don't, don't let his action determine yours. But here's the thing. I would try to get there, uh, go, go to your early Mass on Sunday. I, I recommend that you be prepared with the Holy Eucharist before you go there. Because, you know, I, I get concerned when preachers are trying to make uh, facile connections between contemporary events and biblical prediction. And here's why. This is what's to, something always to watch out. Because I get a lot of questions about these things. That it becomes a temptation to force contemporary events into the biblical prophecies, you end up filtering out important information and you don't pay close attention to what's actually happening on the ground. And that's what we have to uh, you know, have a strong sense of. You have to pay close attention to what is happening and make sure that you don't filter out some factors or invent some ideas. That's what I would ask you to watch out for as he, as he describes the connection with Ezekiel 38 and 39. Is, you know, and try to follow what's happening in the actual news events and look up some history of all of these wars. It's, you know, you're going to have to do some background because 
I don't think the news services are always doing justice to the very complex situation you have there. So do that and see what, what happens, okay? But I'd go to Mass first, and then as soon as Mass is done, go to you. You can come in late. The, the members of that Protestant church will be coming in late too. They'll be there when they get there. All right, I have another question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Uh, from Woodland, Alabama, Father Mitch. You sure don't sound like <laughs> Alabama to me. <laughs> I'm now an American citizen, so we've settled in, uh, in Alabama. It's wonderful. Great, great. Good to have you here. Yeah. So what's, what's your question? Well, uh, a statement first. I wanted to thank you, really. I've learned so much from your programs over the, over the months and the years. You draw out so many extra significances and explanations and interpretations that don't immediately leap off the page. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. My pleasure. Um, there are several mentions in the gospel of Jesus teaching in uh, both the temple and the synagogues. And I just wondered why, uh, if, if there's a distinction between the synagogue mm -hmm. and the temple. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, the synagogue and the temple were the realms of different parties. So the synagogues were basically started and operated by the Pharisee party. The Pharisees were primarily, not exclusively, but primarily a lay reform movement within Judaism. The Sadducees were from the priests and the nobility in Israel. And they, the priests especially, operated the temple because only a priest could offer the sacrifices. Sometimes the high priest had to do it, like on Yom Kippur, and other priests could do other sacrifices on other uh, days and uh, for other kinds of sacrifice. But that was the realm of the priests. And all of Israel had to come there because that was the only location where they could offer sacrifice. They couldn't offer sacrifice at a synagogue. That was forbidden, only in the temple. And so the, the, the Sadducees and the, the high priests especially ran the temple, while the Pharisee party primarily ran the synagogues. And they had the synagogues in order to teach people how to live the law. It was primarily oriented towards instruction and prayer. So they would teach scripture, read scripture, uh, discuss it, and uh, sing praise to God in the synagogues all over the country. Does that help? Yeah, yeah. Good. All right, now we have an email. This is an interesting one. Um, hello, Father Mitch. Last week, my grandchildren had a couple days off from school, so they stayed with me. Mm, nice to be grandma. And as we began the rosary and completed the Apostles' Creed, one of the children stated that they do not say the word hell in their Catholic school. The religious sisters want them to leave it out. So I asked, why? Good question. And the response was, it's not a nice word. They've been taught to say he descended, and on the third day, I find it difficult to believe, but with so much let's be nice going on in the church, it may be possible. If this is happening, I fear that more children will grow up not believing in hell. Helen. Well, Helen, let me uh, say a couple things. First, I agree with the sisters. Hell is not a nice word. Okay, that's true. However, I I know this is going crazy. I disagree with the sisters about leaving it out at an appropriate place. This is an appropriate place. My, sis my, my sister's children, when they were small, used to love to sing um, a Leroy Brown song because there was a bad word in there and they could get away with saying it. Um, but this hell is bad, but saying it is not bad. And letting kids, I mean, kids, uh, you know, may not need to have lurid pictures of hell painted for them with words as uh, uh, Hitchcock, the 
famous movie maker had said, he acquired his sense of the macabre from the Jesuits that taught him in England uh, because of their vivid descriptions of hell. But you don't have to do that with children, but you do let, have to let them know that it exists and also to help them explain that the hell there is not the place of, of damnation. Hella was the old English word for uh, Sheol or Hades, the place of the dead. Not condemnation, but the place where all the dead were waiting for Christ to come preach to them. So they just need more instruction, not avoidance of difficult things. Then we have another interesting email from John in Virginia. Father Packwell from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verses 5 to 7. I shall show you whom to fear. Be afraid of the one who, after killing, has the power to cast into Gehenna. Yes, I tell you, be afraid of that one. Are not five sparrows sold for two small coins? Yet not one of them has escaped the notice of God. Even the hairs of your head have all been counted. Do not be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. How are we supposed to deal with this? Be afraid, be not afraid. John, you, you know, think about this, that you know, there's some things to be afraid of. Someone who can send to Gehenna, by the way, Gehenna, was the term used by Christ to describe the place of hell as condemnation. Gehenna is in and, and, and Arabic today, Jehennam, uh, the Arabic equivalent of Je Gehenna, uh, it means hell. So you should fear someone who can kill you and send you to hell. So someone who induces you to commit mortal sin and then kills you. Uh, now, what, what would that be? Again, remember, I'm from Chicago originally, and there were mafiosi who, when they hated you, would, and it, because they took each other out a lot, they would kill each other. And if they didn't like you, if they hated you, they would wait until you were coming out of a house of ill repute or out of a girlfriend's house or a mistress house and then shoot you to make sure you went to hell. That's the guy you fear. Whereas if someone wants to kill you and destroy you because you are doing what is good, don't fear that man because he cannot send you to hell. Hell is what you should be afraid of, not death. And that would be the distinction. Though the distinction is we've run out of time. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And at this time, we have to make sure that we all are praying for peace, but a peace that also brings true justice. True justice, again, as I said a few weeks ago, that you don't want peace for one side against the other or justice for one side against the other. I want peace and justice for the people of Israel and peace and justice for the people of Palestine, for everyone involved. That's what it means for us to be Christians who love everyone as Christ loves us. God bless you all and keep you.